Hi, Luis. Are you there? Hey. Hi, how are you, Matt? How are you? Know, thank you for coming. This is thank you. It's good to see you. Wait, you know, a couple minutes as usual. Hi, Luis. How are you doing? I'm Hi. Roberto. Hi, Roberto. Thank you for coming. It's great to meet you, and thank you for uh, you know, sharing your work with us and for the insights. We're really excited to have you on. My pleasure. What, what, are you a scholar there? What's your... Yeah, so I am now uh, the library's deputy director. So I was the Wilson branch manager, the largest neighborhood library. And so now mm -hmm. I'm a deputy of the library system. So I'll be welcoming everyone in a couple of months. ¿Y de dónde eres? Uh, mi madre es de México. Mi papá es de los Estados Unidos. Y por eso soy mexicana afroamericana. Oh, wow. Is this like a South Los Angeles mix, man? As I <laughs> exactly, right. In Connecticut, everyone thinks, oh, wow. Everyone thinks I'm from California. Right? I tell them I'm from Yeah, that's a totally South LA mix. Yeah. Are you from the East Coast? I'm from the East Coast originally. My mom is uh, was born in Mexico and then moved to uh, Kansas when she was a teenager. And then my dad's from the state. So I, I basically was born and raised in New Haven. So. Oh, wow. But a family in California, like Anaheim area. So. Yeah. My friend has a, has a kid who's, she's Mexican and her husband is African-American and her kid is a journalist. Hey. Uh, I forget his last name. But he's a, he's a pretty, he writes for the New York Times, I think. Wrote oh, a book. Cool. Cool. Maybe wait one more minute, Luis. Okay. Shall we? Yeah, we can do it. Great. All right, so uh, good evening. Welcome everyone to our new installment of Democracy in America, the virtual NHFPL. Uh, my name is Luis Chavez Bromel, and I am the new library deputy director of the New Haven Free Public Library. Uh, welcome to this great event, uh, this wonderful conversation between Roberto Lovato and Matt Jacobson. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, Mr. Lovato's book, Unforgetting, is available for curbside pickup. So please uh, don't forget to reserve your copy. And so uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll leave it for the main event with uh, Professor Matt Jacobson and Mr. Robert Lovato. Great, thank you so much, Luis. Uh, thank you to our partners at the New Haven Free Public Library as ever. Um, this is a, it's a partnership that means a lot to us. And um, they say vaccine is on the way and we look forward to um, being in the library with you once again uh, before too long. In the meantime, we do what we can. Uh, thanks to my colleague, uh, Karen Rothman, who's working behind the scenes and who, as ever, has done a lot of work for this event, and also our associate, Amy Depoy, uh, who has also uh, worked hard on this event. Um, one program note, next week, a week from right now, um, Tuesday, December 15th at seven o'clock, I will be speaking with my colleague, Zarina Graywall, um, who teaches anthropology and American studies and ethnic studies at Yale. And uh, the title of her presentation is What We Still Get Wrong About 9-11. Uh, so we look forward to that, to that conversation. Uh, and now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, Roberto Lovato. Uh, Roberto Lovato is a journalist and writer currently based in the Bay Area and a member of the writing group in San Francisco called The Grotto. He's been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley's Center for Latino Policy Research, and he's received a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. His writing spans the hemisphere, focusing on migration, US empire, national security, the war on drugs, climate change, and both state and non-state violence. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including The Nation, The Guardian, Foreign Policy, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, Mother Jones, uh, and he's appeared on MSNBC, Univision, CNN, the BBC, NPR, and Pacifica's uh, Democracy Now. Before his current book, 
He was perhaps best known uh, for his work on Juan Crow, the Latinx variant of Jim Crow oppression, and for uh, Gulf Coast Slaves, an investigative expose about migrant workers in post-Katrina in New Orleans. His new book, Unforgetting, a memoir of family migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas is just out from HarperCollins. It's uh, a unique and uniquely important work of social and historical analysis and personal memoir, tracking three generations of dispossession and violence from the US interventionism in Central America to the gang violence among Salvadoran migrants in LA, uh, a dynamic exploration of the relationship between imperialism and immigration between state violence and street violence. Mike Davis writes of the book, for generations from McKinley to Trump, the United States has cast a shadow of exploitation and counter-revolution over Central America. In this stunning tale of love and horror, Lovato recounts how his own family history from the indentured Salvadoran countryside to the burning streets of Los Angeles has been shaped by resistance to Yankee violence. So Roberto Lovato, welcome to the New Haven Free Public Library. Matt, and thank you to Luis and the NHFPL and the Yale Public Humanities Program. It's my honor and pleasure to be with you. And I feel especially at home with the uh, acronym for the library, actually, NHFPL. So the, as you'll read in my book, the guerrilla organization that I belong to was called Las Fuerzas Populares de Liberación. So the short, the abbreviation for it was FFL, FPL. So I'm grateful that the New Hampshire Library took the code of the FPL and is making me feel quite at home here today. Great. Well, welcome. It's, it's great to see you. Um, I have a thousand questions uh, for us to talk about, and we'll take questions in real time too, by the way. You can use the Q&A function on your Zoom. Um, but first, uh, Roberto will begin uh, by reading a passage from the book, and then we will take off from there. Okay, yes. Uh, so we're, you know, I thought it would be good to talk about, the book is a, is a journey into multiple underworlds. You know, the underworlds of, as in my title, the underworld of our family, right? Uh, family secrets. The underworlds of the immigrant life, where I go to immigrant prisons in Texas. The underworlds of the gangs. And the other underworlds of the revolutionary organizations, like the one I belonged to before. Um, and so I thought it would be good to take you into one of them um, and I'll let you guess and figure it out from what I read, if I may. So the scene is I'm with my driver whose name is Isaias and he's been my loyal driver for years and he's got, taken me to some of the scariest places they are in the Western Hemisphere uh, as El Salvador at this moment is, had become the most violent country on earth in terms of homicides. So um, yeah, we're in a coffee shop and we're, you know, we're talking and, 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 and here we go. And he's just picking me up. I greet him. Buenos dias, joven. I'm only about three years older than Isaias, but he looks a lot younger. Unlike his beer-bellied fe fellow former soldier, El Sereno, Isaias keeps his frame tight and fit. The muscles bristling from his neck, arms, and chest in fitted yellow sport shirt give his face a golden aura. His large brown eyes that are open wide when he's animated, which is often, also make him look younger. His own take on his looks that he once told me, yeah, people tell me I have an Indian face. All I need are the feathers. Sometimes Isaias humor strays into the racist territory that is still rife in Salvadoran society, uh, but otherwise adds a welcome dose of levity in the violent landscape we've traversed together. During this time, our camaraderie has developed to a point where I generally trust him on a personal level, but not with my FMLN past. The FMLN is, is the guerrillas. I've told only a few close friends and family about that. After almost 25 years of clandestinity, secrets, and fear, thousands of us in the United States and in El Salvador continue to keep our former militancy buried. In my post-war identity as scholar, activist, and journalist, I fear that far from lived my far from liberal politics would affect my livelihood. Remembering the role of the CIA in assassinating compañeros and supporting the Salvadoran military and Esquadrones, death squads, giving me ongoing concern for my, give me ongoing concern for my physical safety. 
Having been arrested on false charges during a protest in San Francisco with arrest reports signed by the FBI and having harassed by, been harassed by Escuadrones de la Muerte during my early post-war years at Carecen, the refugee organization I worked at in LA, I don't feel safe. In fact, Senators Joe Biden, John Kerry, and others went on to document the ways US government agencies and their right-wing Salvadoran henchmen surveilled, threatened, and tried to infiltrate our sanctuary and solidarity organizations after the war. All these concerns weigh heavily on me at any time I feel the desire to publicly unforget the revolutionary part of me. Isaiah's bright eyes are clean white around the iris, clearer than most, always. A sign that he's not a boozer, unlike Jorge El Chele, the light-skinned one, another driver my cousin Maria Elena sent me up with years before I met Isaias. El Chele's eyes were always ablaze with red streaks of sleeplessness, stress, and heavy drinking with prostitutes. Off to Mr. Do off to Mr. Donuts, and then more interviews. Isaias asks, "We'll go to Mr. Donut, but no interviews. Why not? I have other kinds of work I need to do." Several me weeks after meeting with Santiago, the top gang, one of the top gang leaders, I'd almost finished most of my research for my news stories. In the process, I ingested enough violence, trauma, and duplicity in present day El Salvador to stir the wells of my own terror to the point where they, are, they can no longer be ignored. I'm not going to leave without investigating my family's past. So I tell ESIS we're going to be taking several road trips over the next few days. Our first stop will be the University of El Salvador, where the country's preeminent story, historian of Chapan, my father's hometown, has agreed to speak with me. Tomorrow we'll drive to Nahuizalco, one of the last remaining indigenous towns in the country. From there, we head to Chapan and Ataco, Don Miguel's home, the home of my grandfather. But first, breakfast at Mr. Donut and Chiltupan, a couple of blocks down from Maria Elena's and a few blocks up from poor Giovanni's garage, where someone else had already set up another body shop. We're off in his rusty, creaky Toyota, my Rocinante, as the car rattles over rocks and rubble of Maria Elena Street. Isaias listens to the daily news as this is ritual. The suicide bombers killed at least 10 people and wounded more than 60. The radio announcer drones in the driest, most un-Salvadoran Spanish imaginable. The polar opposite of the syncopated, sing-song Salvadoran sportscasters, loteria managers, or Isaias. Things are really violent there, Isaias says in his high-pitched ref voice referring to the latest news from Kabul. El Salvador is actually more violent than Afghanistan or Iraq right now, I say. Only Syria is more violent than El Salvador. Shit, he says, but no, not in response to anything I've just said. Those terroristas had balls, like the guerrilleros terroristas during the war. His references to the war halt the conversation. I'm not sure what to say, even though I left the FMLN over 23 years ago, and even though I detest the current FMLN government's murderous mano dura hard hand strategy to combat gangs, Isaias' comment about them being terroristas pushes at an insecurity deep in my gut, one that wants, that needs, to preserve my memory of the FMLN fighters of the 1980s and 90s as heroes. So you think it takes balls to blow yourself up like that? I ask Isaias, steering the conversation to safer shores. Definitely. The Ejército trained us in how to kill. He says, but nobody could train me to kill myself like that. I make a mental note of his concern about his mili this military stuff I've never delved into with him as we arrive at our destination. The escopeta wielding guard at Mr. Donut lot greets us with a smile. We park, order our food, and sit down at one of the dozens of plastic booths, just like when we just like when we met with the Comandos Urbanos, urban commandos, during the war over two decades before. There's no smell in Mr. Donut. We're in a time warp, the sterile Americano style banality of the restaurant, once again in stark contrast to the fraught Salvadoran situation I'm bringing to it. You know, boss, your job is about telling stories, about violence here, right? Yes? Well, I have my own stories. Isaias is quite a funny storyteller. He'll tell you tales of comedy and tragedy with the same toothy, nervous smile, which stretches across his face and beams outward. He, he wears it whether we're bra braving clandestine gang hideouts or dealing with crooked cops, giving the appearance he's getting off on the thrill and danger. My visit to the 
forensics labs and the bone room is still fresh in my mind, as are the smells of the dead. So I asked Isaias if he had any, any stories about smells. Smells, he asked. His nostrils widen, his brow furrows, and his lips tighten to the side. He thinks about it for a few seconds before the light bulb pulls the muscles of his friendly face upward. Before he begins, we start digging into the Salvadoran breakfast, plato typico, avocado, Salvadoran sour cream, tortilla, and casamiento, the wedding of rice and black beans mixed together. As plastic and franchise and gringo as Mr. Donuts is, their plato typico is pretty good. So during the war, my General René Emilio Ponce ordered me Coronel Mendez Rodriguez to put together a rescue mission. The name Ponce pushes a big gulp of casamiento down my throat. Ponce was the general and former minister, defense minister, mentioned in the United Nations Truth Commission report for having issued orders to kill six Jesuit priests and their housekeepers in 1989. A School of the Americas graduate, Ponce had been implicated in other crimes against humanity as well. A rescue mission, I ask, yes. They assigned us to go rescue the remains of five soldiers killed near Conacastes, he says. They were left there by those culeros, queers, in the Bracamonte Battalion. Really, I ask. Yes, mi coronel Mendez says to me, Diablito, I want you to lead a force of three men for the mission while the others fight it out with the guerrillas. Diablito, that's what they called you, little devil? Yes, why? Because of how I look, how dark I am, he explained, flashing an unusually sly smile in response. I'll leave it there because I want you to read the book, but uh, needless to say, that conversation led me to find out that Isaias was a death squad operative himself. He reveals it to me. And I'm just like shitting in my pants, quite frankly, in disbelief. This loyal person who I'd known for years finally decided and is inspired by smell to tell me about this part of his life that he, he had not revealed to me over the years that I had known him. And it, it reflects the way that, you know, I mentioned Underworld, these secrets and this violence and this trauma is, is uh, deeply rooted in our, in our lives, not just as Salvadorans, but as people of the United States, as, as the book shows. I mentioned the School of the Americas, which was you know, training the generals and the top military leaders to uh, do what they did in the counterinsurgency war that left 80,000 dead, 85% of whom were killed by their own government, according to the United Nations Truth Commission that looked at this. And so my book looks at the intimate connection between violence in El Salvador and violence in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, you know, one of the stunning things about the book is it's, it's made up of, of very vivid scenes like the one that you just read, um, encounters, kind of street level um, experience, uh, street level encounters that you have with various people. Um, but at the same time, it has this kind of epic scope to it that runs from the 1930s to nearly the present, um, the, the, the 20 teens. Um, and it spans, I mean, geographically, it really spans the, the whole hemisphere. Um, in the opening chapters of the book, you, you begin with a few stories or vignettes devoted to children. Can you talk a little bit about um, who, those, who those kids were and how you use their stories to get into the, the, just the sweeping history um, that, you're, that you're managing in the book? Yeah, um, it's funny you should say epic because after I finished the book and I started editing and re-editing and re-editing as we as writers do, right? Because as they say, editing is writing. Um, I realized, damn, man, this is a, an intense story. <laughs> it's epic over generations that my father's generation lived in the 30s, that I lived through in the 80s, that the children now are living through now. And so that's why I thought the best way to tell the story was what they would, what they call a braided narrative where I have like seven sections and each of them is divided into three parts. One is the present, which is 2015, the moment El Salvador becomes the most violent country on earth and I'm trying to understand why as a journalist. The second se uh, section is the 1970s to 2000, my adolescence and my, my grow, my, the story of my uh, father and I, and which is another way to say the story of my re rebellion because Nobody made me a rebel more than my father. 
uh, as is many, happens with many of us. And then the last section is my father's childhood. And so I begin the book, as you mentioned, with three different sections about three children. A child that I meet in a, an immigrant prison in 2015, you know, the children that are, would go on to be caged and, and then separated by uh, Jay Johnson, Obama's um, Homeland Security chief, right? And then continued by Trump afterward. So I'm, I'm meeting with these kids and a child who's like about seven, his name's David, he tells me this horrific story, one of many I've heard over decades, and it launches me on my journey. Second uh, 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 story is my own, beginning of my own childhood, which was, you know, how I went from being known as Mr. Peabody with Coke bottle glasses uh, and, and, and loving reading so much that I stole books from the Mission Library uh, with my friend Freddie Weinstein to begin my criminal uh, history, my criminal activity was stealing books. And then the third child is my father, who, as you will read in the book, if you read it, has an astonishing secret. And it really is, according to anybody that's read it, astonishing that he's, uh, what he went through and never said anything for 75 years. And so I, you know, I adopted a braided narrative to tell this underworld story uh, that, you know, because I'm required to go into these different underworlds to get at the deeper truths that are hidden behind layers of silence, of myth, of trauma, of shitty media reporting by my peers, like who never told you that Obama, for example, caged, separated, even killed thousands of migrant children and mothers, and like the children that died in the deserts or mothers and fathers who died in, in detention, which is really a code word for prisons. And, 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 this, and, and so uh, this, and, and, and doing it this way also allowed me to get at the fragmentation that's a part of modernity for all of us, if we're alive, right? But also the fragmentation that's added by trauma and violence. And so unforgetting I got from um, reading the Greek journey into the underworld, Aletheia, which where the dead were required before going to the, before going to Elysium or Hades, were required to cross the Lethe River, which was the river of forgetting, and, um, and forget who they were in life. And so Anna Arendt, trying to kind of get her, her mind around, her brilliant mind around fascism and the rise of fascism, rescued this idea of aletheia to talk about the necessity for us to rescue and, and, and excavate the history that is forgotten that enables and the forgetting that enables fascism. And so I thought it would be a perfect way to kind of talk about these things now. Yes. Yeah, I want to come back to unforgetting. But first, let me just say, it's actually striking to hear you describe your method in the book, because it's now that you mentioned it, I can see exactly the structure that you're talking about, but that's not one's experience of reading it. It does not, it, there's nothing kind of mechanistic about how you, how you're, you know, crossing through time in the, in the way that you do it. And in the stories are so compelling and it's so, I just think it's really artfully braided to use your, your term, um, that, that, that really kind of, um, strict and methodical structure that you're describing that kind of underlays it is it goes it went beyond my notice anyway what i what i noticed is that i was kind of moving through time in a really compelling way but i i, I wasn't on to just um how you were how you were getting from one place to another um that's what makes so, the artist the puppet master you know you gotta like <laughs> you're leading the reader to a certain place that you want in structure I mean, I, I, I really become a super fan of what I call the poetry of structure. You know, the way you structure things is a poetry in it. And if you do it right, um, you know, it, 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 it really has a powerful effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's go back to unforgetting, because I think that that's um, a term and a, a concept that just has a thousand meanings in this book. And it's in every single register. I mean, it's at, at a very personal level. There's a lot of unforgetting that is required of you and of your family members. Um, but your mention of fascism, I mean, there's a kind of unforgetting that is really required of, of us up here in the US. Um, 
who who need to unforget you know what mike davis calls that shadow that 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 our country has cast across the hemisphere so can you talk about some of the different ways that you thought about unforgetting in this work yeah um first and foremost it was personal i grew up i'm here in san francisco i grew up three blocks from where my office is here on mission street on Folsom street down the street from the projects and you know working class immigrant family home i was born here but most of my siblings were born most of my family was from El Salvador. So, um, you know, um, so I grew up in a, in a crowded apartment where we had all kinds of pictures of my mom's mom, my mom's sisters, brother, sister, brothers, um, nephews, nieces, dogs, goldfish. I mean, you name it. We had everybody in my mom's family plastering our walls and looking at us in their love and from from down south and there was only one picture of my dad oh. dad's family a picture of his mom mama te who is a seamstress who is the matriarch of our family that was brilliant and powerful to bring her family and become the first in our family to come here and establish uh herself and us in the united states and so I, I, for me i had to unforget who my father was and who what who my father's family and I had to do a lot of research and kind of find the ways that places like the Dart Center for Journalism teach us to get at secrets and, and, and helping people talk about trauma in ways that aren't triggering and ways that respect the person instead of just parachuting in. Fortunately, I had been embedded in my father's life <laughs> my entire life, so I had some advantages. And, but I still had to use some of those techniques to get at my dad's secrets. Once I started piecing together, like, you know, my one of my childhood heroes, Columbo, the disheveled detective, uh, you know, so I, I, it begins in the family and then the process of unforgetting extends to um, myself. Like, I, I, I was gonna write it as a journalist story initially. And then I realized if I'm gonna talk about my dad and I'm gonna talk about myself, I wanna have a real, give the reader a real experience of violence. I have to go deeper than just being a journalist objectively looking at the facts from outside. I had to go inward. I had to look at my own experience of war and I had to come out with my secrets. Like I've never been out about having been a, a former guerrillero until I wrote the book, you know, intimate people. So, and, and, and so unforgetting is a process, not just of excavating the trauma, the death and the bad things in our families, in our, in ourselves, but also the good things, the most, in the case of, say my work with El Salvador, I think some of the most best parts of who I am come out of that in terms of, for example, the poet warrior tradition that I belong to and identify with. And it's the subject of my next book. Oh, and, and so, and to conclude, like this then led me to understand, um, it's interesting, Mike Davis, you mentioned, uh, talks about the shadow. I didn't know that. Mike's a good friend. He, I had my first public event with Mike. Um, the shadow is what I see Donald Trump as, for example. He's, a, he's an expression of the shadow of the United States. And I see Barack Obama as what psychologists call the mechanism of denial. It doesn't change the core underlying structure of the society and the capitalism and the empire of it, but it makes you feel good about it, like Kamala Harris and, and Biden are doing right now. So I wanted to get at that because I've been, you know, people are talking about these apocalyptic times where shit, I've crossed 30 years and 2,500 miles of war, you know, mass grave sites across the entire northern part of the continent, genocide and gang violence, all of which have the fingerprints of the United States on them. And so I've been like, okay, yeah, it's about time you started thinking about apocalyptic matters because we've been in them for a while. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's drill down on that a little bit. Um, I mean, and this is another thing that the book does really beautifully, I think, and deeply. But um, can you talk a little bit about what the case, what the case of El Salvador, what does it teach about the relationship between hemispheric politics and transnational migration? Um, you know, what are, what are some of the things you wish everyone in the U.S. knew about El Salvador? First and foremost, I think I want people to know, you know the, the most, the most quoted phrase in the English language about El Salvador and Salvadorans comes from Joan Didion. 
a liberal writer who is quite gifted as a writer, super gifted, I admired growing up, um, who said of El Salvador and Salvadorans, terror is the given of the place. So if you look at writing about El Salvador, be it journalism, be it writing about gangs up to the present, if it's, or writing about Trump or Obama or anybody talking about El Salvador, it, it tends to be a variation on the theme of terror is the given of the place. So first and foremost, my mission in writing this was to say, I, I used to try to fit my life into Joan Didion's beautiful words. Wow, that's deep. Terror is the given of the place. Well, well shit, hold on here, man. I, Joan Didion was in El Salvador for two, all of two weeks, right. mostly with the embassy. I've spent 50 odd years of my life being Salvadoran, connected to Salvadorans, loving Salvadorans, being inspired by Salvadoran. Where the hell is that? <laughs> so I like, oh my God. So I came up with the idea that love is also a given of the place. And that would be what, first and foremost, I want people to remember about uh, El Salvador and about Salvadorans is that we are as uh, loving, as human, as sometimes brilliant in the case of others, uh, and, 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 and sublime and beautiful as the best of them. And so in the book, what I try to do is use the dark velvet background of the history of terror and violence and genocide to highlight the diamonds and stars and beautiful things of Salvadoran life. That is what I won't most want because it is those diamonds and those stars and that example of the Salvadoran revolutionary struggle that we're going to need as we all enter a moment in world hemispheric and national history where we're going to need more than simply the liberal or pro even progressive imaginary. We're going to need something a little stronger than progressivism and liberalism to get out of not just COVID or Trump fascism and the decline of the US, but if we deal with that, we're still gonna have to deal with climate change, which is the fight of our lives. So we need, we, I, I wrote it as a way to communicate what I'm, my project is about is what I've learned from the hemisphere about what it takes to have sustainable struggle. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think you can actually draw a straight line from uh, as, as counterintuitive as it might be, you can draw a straight line from Joan Didion's brief little book about Salvador to Donald Trump's comment about shithole countries <laughs> in, in the sense that, I mean, that's kind of, that's like the U.S. sin is, is to misrecognize the fallout of our own capitalism and our own imperialism and our own militarism and, and mistake it for the country that, you know, fill in the blank, the country that Salvadorans made, the country that Cubans made, the country, the country that Angolans made. And, um, and to, to, to not see the shadow that we're casting, to not see the, the fallout of our own policies, but to, to kind of displace it through amnesia onto the peoples themselves. You know, so, so Salvador is a site of terror because it's filled with terroristic people. Right. It's a continuation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which is coincidentally the opening quote in Joan Didion's book. Mm. It's just a, you know, like if you look at the gang images with tattoos, right? Like MS-13 or 18th Street, they're all tattooed in their faces, they're exoticized. These images are not the reality because I can tell you and anybody that knows the gangs knows that most of the gang and gang leaders, gang members now don't sport tattoos on their faces. That goes back like more than almost a decade or more. And, um, but yeah, these are the images that prevail. There's going to be an HBO movie about some FBI agent who infiltrated the most dangerous gang in the world. And so you get these exotic, uh, tropicalized images that reproduce the image of Salvadorans. And my mission with the book was, quite frankly, to try to destroy that image to the degree possible with a powerful dose of humanity and the sublime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of that, um, a lot of that is embedded in your family story. Um, I wanna come back to the present and talk more about um, Trump and Obama and kind of the, the fix that we're in right now. But, um, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna um, 
overlook your really important work on the 1930s. You don't have to, you don't have to give away your father's secret um, to, to tell this, but can you tell us a little bit about, about El Salvador in the 1930s and, and some of the, what you, what you learned about the countryside back in, in, in his childhood for that generation? You, you gotta remember, El Salvador, as I like to say, El Salvador was going through a great depression that made Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath look like a wine festival. Okay, so you're talking about a really intense decline in the price of coffee and therefore a decline in the value of worker life in El Salvador uh, to the point where the workers had to rebel and most of those workers were indigenous. And there was an indigenous uprising uh, influenced by uh, a communist like Parabundo Marti and a guy named Alfonso Luna, uh, who my dad actually knew. It's amazing what you find out from your parents when you kind of just do the homework of excavating the truth. So there was a rebellion and it was put down in the most violent uh, way in what scholars at Oxford, like Sanders, uh, Anders Sandberg at Oxford, uh, at an institute on the future in, in our, and he's a mathematician. He told me that, you know, he was a student of violence. He said that that moment in El Salvador was the single most violent episode in modern history, as far as the numbers of people killed per day, per week in a concentrated space. And so um, that was a foundation on which the longest lasting military dictatorship in the Americas was established by a guy named Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. And so Salvadoran history in many ways is these three figures kind of going back and forth, the descendants of, of, of the fascist military dictator over the years, the descendants of the indigenous people that were silenced in many ways, but never dead completely, and the leftist kind of insurgency of the communists that, in fact, El Salvador was the site of the first communist insurgency in the Americas. So um, that continues throughout, you know, up to the peace accords in 1992. And then you have this post-war thing that is what we're living through now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um... and, oh, and the United States, by the way, didn't recognize Mar uh, Martinez government in 32, but it did recognize it two years later in 1934 and sustained the military dictatorships. To go back to your other question about the role of the United States in training military dictators in places like the School of the Americas, in training military leaders, in funding death squads, in funding mass murdering militaries, in promoting uh, these leaders as legitimate in the world, on the world stage, legitimizing mass murders and crime, criminals against humanity. These have been the friends of the United States throughout Salvadoran history, but that part is not really told to us. And that part was a bipartisan project, right? It was Democrat and Republican. Mm -hmm. So what, um, to what extent was um, investment and kind of extractive industries, um, the, the consolidation of arable lands, like all, you know, all of the things that go into uh, monopoly capital um, in the context of the kind of hemispheric power relations between U.S. companies, basically, backed by the U.S. government and, and Central American lands. How did that, how did that work in, in the case of El Salvador? Yeah, you, you have to remember that a lot, of, a lot of the way that 20th century capitalism in Latin America organized countries was to designate different countries as the source resources for specific material. In the case of El Salvador, one of them, a major one, the definitive one in the early 20s, after indigo, it became coffee. Mm -hmm. And so um, here in San Francisco, you have companies like Hills Brothers and Folgers who are headquartered here. And so my family came following the ships that brought the coffee like many Salvadorans came to the United States. And so I, I try to help people understand these dynamics less as a sociologist and more as a, this is part of my story. Like, um, you know, Salvadorans have been coming to the United States, specifically to California first, um, since the 19th century, since the gold rush here in California, where, um, you know, many Salvadorans came posing as miners and then learned how to do mining. Um, so, so El Salvador uh, became the mono, coffee became king. And 
that restructured, yeah, that created the need to steal Indian land and in many cases kill Indians and, or assimilate them, right? Uh, and, 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 and control that land and grow coffee on it for export and that organized people's lives. And so like, and it has effects on the identity, for example, of indigenous people. Like if you go to my dad's hometown and like I did and I, you look at uh, the birth records before La Matanza, the incident where there's a genocide against somewhere between 10,000 to 30,000 indigenous people. We still don't know. You look at the birth records in my dad's hometown, most of the children born there are indios, right? Which is the word for indigenous at that time. If you look at the birth records after La Matanza, they're no longer majority indio. They're now this category that the state created of campesino. And so the peasant, the peasant used to be an indigenous person. And you see the way that history will remake those identities and that it's rooted in in the dynamics of coffee and domination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my dad narrates this, but from the street level, like you're saying, like he would see what would happen to the indigenous workers. He actually knew one of the top revolutionaries because his best friend was the brother of, of Alfonso Luna. Something he never even said anything about. I'm like, right. you know. Well, I mean, that's one of the amazing things too, is, I mean, it seems in your narrating of it that Along the way, you learned an awful lot about um, about silence and also about trauma and the ways that that trauma is passed uh, from one generation to the next, or or can actually settle across a whole community. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I don't actually. The art in obviously in all this is always to try for me at least was not to use the word trauma. Mm -hmm. I think I only use it once, and it's when somebody else says it. Maybe twice. I don't know, but it's not me saying the word. Right, right. It's somebody else. Because I want the reader to kind of like do what you did, which was, oh yeah, this is about trauma. And so it, I think it deepens the experience because we all have, have some form of trauma and it, it connects us in all, often in not very positive ways. So uh, I saw, I mentioned at the beginning that I, at the beginning of the book that I met this child who had witnessed this horrific incident of, you know, that a lot of unfortunately kids in El Salvador and even in the United States have to witness now and, um, you know, and then I, you know, I've started understanding my dad's story and some of the things that he witnessed. And then in my mind, I started seeing an umbilical connection between those two children. Mm -hmm. But to, and this is where the clincher for me to have to write it as a memoir was not just my dad, but my own story, because I could help the reader understand what I inherited from my dad, right? Because my dad went through some stuff and I didn't even know he had it. And I didn't know why I joined a clique that had me stealing cars, robbing people, engaging in violence, you know, and doing things that were contrary to the law. I didn't know why I did that. I didn't know why I joined the guerrillas until I discovered this stuff about my dad. And then I realized, damn. So then as a journalist, I then take the lens and I look at the gangs. The reader's already been with me on my journey and they're gonna look at the gangs through my lens, which is not the policing, statist, I would even say fascistic lens on the gangs that tells you, for example, that MS-13 is the most violent gang in the world. There's no statistical homicide statistic basis for any of this. It's all, it's all false. And so, um, so that, that, that if gang members, I want people to understand that gang members, death squad operatives even, because I humanize, Death squad operatives, because I hate to tell you, but death squad operatives that perpetrate mass murder are part of the human race. And they have quality. They have kids, some of them. They play soccer with their kids like, like you do. They, they killed people 20 years ago, and they're trying to lead a normal life. They have 2.5 cars, maybe, in their Salvadoran suburb. You know, they're like, so I'm, I'm trying to get at and move us, you know, like Nietzsche, move us beyond good and evil. Um, I want to invite questions from uh, from the audience. Please uh, use the Q and A function. And our first one has just come in. There's a question about the Communist Party. Um, it is a remarkable tradition of the Communist Part of El Salvador with people such as Roque Dalton and Miguel Marmol. Uh, what is the status of the Communist Party of El Salvador now? 
Well, really, you know, a great, great question. Uh, for those that don't know, Roque Dalton was the guerrilla poet extraordinaire of, Salva of El Salvador. The greatest poet in Salvadoran history happened to be a guerrillero, a guerrilla combatant too, operating clandestinely and everything. And so he is an example of that poet warrior tradition I'm talking about. That, is it, that it is my mission to translate into the English language and, and to try to reflect in, in my own story. And so uh, Miguel Marmol was a great uh, communist leader in the, in, in the period of the, of the early 30s when La Matanza was perpetrated. And he was one of the first to really document and talk about that. And Roque Dalton wrote that book. So what's happening with the Communist Party now is that it's, it's kind of fall folded into the FMLN. Uh, the Communist Party took the leadership of the FMLN, and it's, it's a complicated story because the FMLN has five groups, one of which was the Communist Party. The other one, one of the other ones was the group that I belong to, the FFL, FPL. And so the leaders of the Communist Party took the reins of the FMLN. And unfortunately, some of them, not all of them, but some of them in key positions went the way of corruption and buying homes on the... Uh, El Volcán de San Salvador, the volcano in San Salvador. So, um, you know, the, you know, but there are at the, at the base level, at the level of the communities, there's still very uh, decent and good and committed people from the different parties, but they're, they're really folded into the FMLN. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in my book is to, because there's been a, you know, it's an ongoing project for the United States or the Salvadoran governments to um, stain the image of, 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 of any revolutionary effort in the world. That's just part of the game. And so their mission is to paint anything that has left communists as evil mm -hmm. or failed or murderous and, and, and take things that actually did happen to erase and forget the things that worked like Cuban healthcare, <laughs> right? right? So, um, you know, so, so that's what, that's my response to that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Here's another question. Um, you mentioned finding techniques to elicit stories without re-traumatizing the storytellers. Can you, can you tell us more about this? Yeah, there's a site, website, maybe somebody in the, uh, on the back end of our operation here can look up the DART Center for Trauma website at Columbia University. I hate to mention another university where I'm talking to Yale, but I'm sorry, I gotta. Quite all right. We're, <laughs> so, not, we're, we're, um, not, we're not company people here. Okay, good, good. So, um, so yeah, like places like the Dart Center and others train journalists in techniques that how to get at, um, how to talk to and approach people who've gone through, say, natural disasters, war, genocide, rape, and, other things, and do it in a way that is. Um, sensitive. And so a major part of it, for me at least, is, is, is not to just parachute into somebody's life, right? If you just parachute into somebody's life, like many journalists do, you're going to do things to trip over and, and, and trigger people's trauma. So the, out of decency and respect and, and actually getting at the deeper story, that's not just the automatic response, you want to um, kind of lay a foundation of trust, building trust, trust building techniques, how you look at people, what you repeat when you talk to them, the tone of voice, the, 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 what you're going to do with their story, reassuring them. And, you know, to the degree that you can, letting them know that you're not just a parachuter into their lives, but you're actually caring and why it's important that others who might read about their story can gain from their story so that people have the dignity of their own um, untriggered story to, to be able to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, you, um, it looks to me, maybe it's not true, um, you've lived a very varied life, um, but it looks like you were kind of picking up some skill sets along the way as you were working, as you're working on this book that you started out, you started out as a journalist and you kind of turned into something else. Can you talk about um, just at the level of, of your kind of intellectual project and your, your own kind of artistic ambitions, um, what this project, I guess I want to ask it this way, what this project did to you 
you know, this, this process that you, you went through to do all this digging and all of this um, kind of reimagining and, and, and giving voice? Wow, what a great question. Um, I had to breathe because that's a, you know, what did it do to me? Number one, I think I rescued, I rescued a huge part of my humanity. Mm. Lost in the silence. I, I got to my dad's tenderest part. I found some of my own. I got to tell the story and I got to look into the abyss of Salvadoran history as expressed in my family. And I made it through. And I really am all the more powerful now that I've done that. I'm fucking dangerous as I've ever been, <laughs> to be really frank. And so uh, fearlessness is knowing your fear and doing what you need to do anyway. And I've tried to lead a life where, as we're taught in El Salvador, in Salvadoreño, Eh, que hay que tocarle los huevos al tigre. You have to touch the balls of the tiger. And I've tried to lead that life um, in journalism and in writing, in word and in deed. But now, like, my, my intimate superpowers are even greater. <laughs> like, you know, because I have less fear to look at myself and at my family because I've done that work, difficult as it is, to, to bring back. So there's dominant metaphors in the book like the metaphor of forensics, piecing together the bones of our memory in our lives, weaving or, or sewing, like my grandmother was a seamstress with her Singer sewing machine, weaving together the threads of life, the different colors, bright and beautiful, dark and ugly, you know, different textures, and putting them together in a, in a way that, for example, in the case of my grandmother, would give a dress to a prostitute who was an indigenous woman who had to deny her identity because she was indigenous after La Matanza and became a prostitute and in a shanty town where my grandmother and my father grew up. And so my grandmother would weave together these pieces of cloth to give this indigenous woman who had to become a prostitute a little bit of the dream of what she had as a little girl. So that's kind of how I see the writing process and my process with the book was first and foremost for myself. And man, thank, thank the gods of writing and, and revolutionary politics that my community, in particular the Salvadorans, have been responding to this book in unbelievable ways, buying five books, sending them for their families for Christmas, um, and, and really feeling really strongly that, because it's the first book in the English language that's written by and about us, published by one of the big five publishers. Mm. So I, it's done a lot for me. It's transformed my life. And um, in terms of the larger project, it begins my larger project, which you know we can talk about if, 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 if you want. Yeah, no, thank you for that. There's, um, there's another question here. Um, this, I think, goes back to something we were talking about earlier, but I, I want to honor the question. Uh, I see some of what you're speaking um, in, in gangs here in the USA with the Black Panther and Young Lords. Uh, they were portrayed as bad um, when their intentions were good as uh, feeding those in need. Is this correct? Are, are, do you agree with that, the kind of... Um... Oh, absolutely. My friend Juan Gonzalez, who's on Democracy Now! and can talk to you about the foundation of the Young Lords, mm -hmm. what they had to go through as a group. Um, I wouldn't exactly make a, an equivalency between, say, these heavy-duty gangs like the Crips and the Bloods and the Black Panthers and, and uh, the Young Lords, but... I will say there are moments of where they coincide on their interests, as happened in Los Angeles dur before, during, and after the LA riots, where the Crips and Bloods had a process of establishing a truce. And this process was perpetually uh, um, um, opposed by LAPD, the FBI, and they were always trying to play the groups off against each other. So, um, yeah, our, our peace is a threat to those who make a living with war. We have just a couple minutes left. I, I know, um, I happen to know, because you told me, that you're, you're heading into another project that is, is in some ways quite different, but in some ways deeply related, and it's not what anybody might expect. It has to do with 
the the macaw. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about that project and what it means to you and and how you see it answering some of these kind of hemispheric questions? Well, my thank you. My uh, pro my larger project. I've come to realize when, especially when I was at Berkeley as a fellow, I came to realize my larger project is about what I call the continental unconscious. That sense of connection that many of us across the continent have that is denied by borders and by nations, right? I mean, you could say it's a planetary thing, but I'll limit the scope of my uh, field of theater of operations to the continent just for good measure. So um, if you look at like, so in search of that, you can see this book, you know, Unforgetting as a, as a tapping into the underworld component of it where, you know, there's a subterranean sense of history that's denied that has to be excavated. Or in the, with the Macaw book, it's about, uh, my mom died in 2013 and I, you know, it's one of the most ang greatest anguish that, that I will know because I love my mother so much. And in the search, for something that would help literally lift me, lift my spirits. I'm at Berkeley researching this one book and then I start getting my, my, my mind and heart start getting, I'm besotted by this bird, the scarlet macaw, this, you know, red, yellow and blue, walking, talking, flying rainbow. And it's just so beautiful that uh, indigenous peoples across the Americas were inspired by them to the point where even, not just in like Venezuela or Colombia or Central America, but in Mexico, the Aztecs would take, if they were, had a choice, the, the Aztec traders, the Postecas, had the choice of, um, of trading gold or macaws and macaw feathers, they inevitably chose macaws to the point where they took them all the way up to what's now Chihuahua near the US-Mexico border. And they would trade these birds in exchange for the turquoise you see on um, Aztec calendars. And so then the people in this place in Northern Mexico called Paquime, which is home to some of the most fabulous uh, ruins in Mexico, uh, started trading with the peoples of, that were the ancestors of the Hopi, the Navajo, and, and, and what were known as the Hohokam and other peoples so that the, they extended human consciousness and, and ingenuity extended the, the habitat of the macaw all the way up to what, what is now Colorado. And so that's like the hemispheric extension of the wings of that bird that is kind of the, an energy very different from what the book I've just talked about with my father and in the underworld. It's my mother's energy. And so the book is going to be about the macaw and this hemispheric consciousness and my mom. Mm. But she was the powerhouse of, uh, of, of my hemispheric consciousness. It sounds like it's also, you, you used the phrase, I think diamonds earlier on talking about the, the, the upside of, of Salvadoran history that, that gets lost in all of this talk of terror. And it, it sounds like this is a, a project that really concentrates on that, on that dimension. And it concentrates both project, both this project and that one. And most anything I would do now to the end of my days is going to have a component, small, large, and colossal of uh, me saying and talking about the things I think we're going to need to face the intersecting crisis that we are facing as, as a human race. And I think there's a, there's a space for artists and writers and creative people right now to really bust open the piggy bank of our political imaginations to do the work that video games are supposed to do in fiction life, which is try to save the world, where we no longer have to watch video games and science fiction movies. We're here, we're the actors, and we need to do it. That is a great place to come to rest in this conversation. Thank you so much, Roberto Lovato. Um, the book is fantastic. Uh, everyone, you should pick it up. Um, thank you for writing it. Thank you for spending some time with us tonight. It's really, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you and to, to think along with you. It's been my pleasure, man, and thank you to everyone. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, next week, um, Zarina Graywall on 9-11. Um, keep your eyes out. Um, we have a pretty packed calendar coming up um, when we resume after the winter break, um, starting in January with... Uh, um, speaking of climate change, with a um, 
an environmental, environmental studies discussion with my colleague, Paul Sabin, um, but the full calendar will be out very soon. So thank you everyone. Thanks to our partners at the, at the library. Um, wear a mask, wash your hands, take good care of yourselves, and we will see you soon. Thanks, Roberto. Thank you.